because of the Netflix show and even before I was very active on social media and really has been helpful in my fighting anti-Semitism work. I am also an Iranian um, Jewish immigrant and so we ended up having to escape Iran in 1985 uh, through the desert on, a back, on the back of a pickup truck um, while being uh, chased by border police and shot at by border police. What is home? Yes, we have our homeland Israel, and yes, we have homes throughout the diaspora. But our current reality is complex. Israel's at war, and anti-Semitism is rising around the world. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for this question of home? Join me, Izzy, as I speak with Israeli and diaspora Jewry to better understand this new complex reality and unpack where we put ourselves in this physical and spiritual war. This is the My Israel Narrative podcast. Hey everyone, today we are lucky to be sitting here with Dr. Sheila Nazarian, who is, uh, I think wears many hats. Amongst them, uh, she is a plastic surgeon in Los Angeles. She has an Emmy-nominated Netflix show, it's very, very cool. Um, you know, you're a speaker, uh, most recently a very proud, strong Jewish Zionist activist um, doing incredible things for the Jewish people and have a lot on my mind that I would love to dive into just to kick us off. If you want to share maybe um, just where we find you today and a little bit about the past few months for you, what, what it's been like. I think I, I describe myself as like the worst Jewish influencer because I'll put all this stuff out and people will be like, can you do an interview? And I'm like, no, I'm in surgery tomorrow. So I'm like the most unavailable bad uh, activist, but I'm doing my best. Um, I am in Los Angeles, as you mentioned, I have my own practice. I have my own skincare line, my own spa. I have three kids, 16, 15 and 12. I'm married to a neurosurgeon whose office is right next to mine, and we share our operating room. Um, what else? Um, because of the Netflix show, and even before I was very active on social media, and I think Netflix just allowed me to gain followers outside of my own echo chamber, which was great, um, and really has been helpful in my anti-Semitism, fighting anti-Semitism work. Um, I'm also an Iranian um, Jewish immigrant. I mean, I'm a citizen. I was born in New York on vacation and we went back to Iran when I was like a month old. The revolution started that year, that was 1979. And so we ended up having to escape Iran in 1985 uh, through the desert on, a back, on the back of a pickup truck um, while being uh, chased by border police and shot at by border police. Um, we were in Pakistan for three months, waiting for visas, finally went to Vienna, waited there for three months for visas so that we could immigrate to the amazing United States of America. So I think I have a unique perspective. I'm brown. I'm an immigrant. I built myself up from, we had nothing. Um, and I think that I'm uniquely positioned to say the things that so many people are unfortunately afraid to say. Uh, so I feel like the uh, Persian brown Joan Rivers, I just say what everybody's <laughs> thinking, but <laughs> is afraid to verbalize. But you know, I'm just done. Like I have three kids, they're about to go to college. I went to Columbia. Columbia just got sued for anti-Semitism. Uh, they denied it, denied it, denied it. And now um, they can deny it no more. It's been decades. And I was just thinking, you know what, my kids are not that far off from university and if I don't start speaking up, what kind of future are they going to have and their kids? So it's kind of motivated by the, the mother uh, instinct, but really it's such important work and I encourage everyone to just start using their voice and stop being the silent majority. Just a quick and going back in terms of your trajectory and your family, when when they had come to America, uh, right when you were born, was at that time, was there any indication that you wouldn't be that the revolution was coming and that you would you know, possibly? I mean, of course there thing? was. But, you know, my dad had a pretty stable job. He, he was um, running the Shah's Heart Hospital at the time. Mm -hmm. His mom was elderly. We couldn't just like leave her and, you know, be like, good luck, you know. So it was kind of like. A lot of unfinished business, I would say. 
a lot of our family got out way before we did. Um, but we sort of had to secure the safety of my grandmother and uh, all of that before we could leave. So there was still ties that we had to attend to in Iran. Sure. And was the, was the thought to always come to America? Like at the time, was there like this American dream and coming here? And... You no, know, I think that if, you know, the, the Shah would have stayed and it wasn't under this Islamic Republic uh, oppressive situation that I think the world is very privy to now, um, we would have stayed. I think everybody would have stayed. But if you, I asked my father as well, like what finally made you guys want to leave? And he just said, I saw that there was no future for women in this country and we have two daughters. There was no future for wow. you guys. And so I think that was the determining factor. It was also like Iran-Iraq war was happening from 1980 to 1985. There was bombs flying everywhere, sirens going off in the middle of the night and you would see the bombs coming in just like you do on TV with you know the missiles coming in from Gaza into Israel. It looked very similar to that. We would go to um, our windows and my mom would be like, look at the fireworks, you know? So, I mean, they, they did a very good job kind of uh, making us calm and not afraid, but it was, you know, a very scary time, uh, not just socially, but also physically. So just like an interesting parallel, because you mentioned that a lot of the drive is kind of like maybe the subconscious later or conscious um, desire to protect the future of your children. It seems like that was the same drive that had your father leave. But for you, it's turned into more of, I'm going to stay and fight. What do you think are some of the differences between what they were experiencing in Iran that kind of made it like, there's no point in even fighting versus well, you know, here? When, when my family left everything, all of the success, all of the wealth, everything, we left it behind. They sacrificed that to bring us to America so that we wouldn't be judged by our religion, race, creed, all of, and have freedom of speech and freedom of thought without fear. I'm at the point where I think if America goes down, where are we going to go? Who's going to help Israel? If America goes down, will Israel be safe? <laughs> like So we have to save America is of my, my mindset. We weren't able to save Iran. I think there's a lot of um, motivation now in Iran and a lot of uh, protests and uh, uh, attempts to change Iran and to kind of take it back to the freedoms that were uh, enjoyed before this regime took over. So I don't want America to make the same mistake. And I smell the same smells of, of the language and the sentiment that led to the downfall of Iran. Uh, things like, why is the Shah living in a castle when there's homeless people on the street? Well, now there's a lot more homeless people on the street in Iran. Uh, there's rampant prostitution, people trying to feed their kids. There's uh, rampant drug abuse. Uh, people in certain cities have um, risen up because they can't find bread and water. Is it better now? Absolutely not. Uh, and so while things sound very altruistic and they sound very heartfelt, in practice, unfortunately, they don't work. And we've seen it over and over again. And as a result of these attempts, massive human suffering and massive human rights violations. And so it's like how people forget so quickly. People get their information from social media rather than reading a book or watching a documentary or listening to firsthand experience of people older than them who may have experienced socialism, communism, uh, Islamism. Okay. And it's time that people listen to people who escaped those worlds and came to America for a better chance and a better life. And isn't it the ultimate yeah. privilege, Izzy, to be completely willfully blind to those things and to be able to just stand on your little soapbox and lecture people about what they should believe when you've never suffered, you've never lived in those countries, much less visited them, but it gives you some sense of purpose in your sad, sad life to feel like, oh, people are paying attention to me on TikTok because I'm speaking up for this cause when you're really speaking out of your ass because <laughs> you have no experience. All right. I mean, I think that's something that's unique about the, the Jewish perspective in particular is that really everybody is almost one, for the most part, one degree removed 
if not themselves. They are one degree removed, Izzy, but we hear our own. Yeah, that I know as well. Unfortunately. Right. Um, right. wanting to fit in so badly that they will defend things like, you know, oppressed versus oppressor and proximity to whiteness and Jews are the oppressor and things like that. They want to fit in so badly in these progressive spaces that they're willing to throw their own people under the bus or worse. Yeah. I mean, there's there's just a lot of mixed messaging. And all, overall, it is this, I think, this constant issue of we Jewish people, we think that by assimilating, fitting in it, assimilating can mean many different things, that that's going to save us. And what I've found so empowering in the past few months is that whereas in the past, God forbid, right, we were being told, wear this Jewish star so we could point you out and we can identify you. Now we're standing up. By and large, not not overall, but much more so than I think has ever happened um, mm-hmm. in recorded history, at least. And saying, "No, I'm a Jew." Like I, I, I didn't walk around with the Jewish star. Uh, no, ever. I'll show you this. I got um, this. Somebody gave this to me for my 16th birthday, and I was like, "What the heck am I going to do with this massive Jewish star?" Hold on, <laughs> like now it's like the biggest thing in the whole world. Oh time. wow! <laughs> I also <laughs> I, I blinged I, out massive Jewish star, and now like that's the one I wear. Um, just to inspire other people to do the same. And to yeah. let people know, don't be afraid. We're in America. There's laws here. And we need to um, use our voice, use our thought, or, or lose it. So can I ask you, also funny enough, I got this when I was like 12 or 13. And it basically just like sat away. I would wear it like once or twice a year or whatever. And then uh, <laughs> yeah. started yeah, started wearing it again. Um, in terms of Israel, so you were, you were explaining how right? Israel is in a sense dependent on the support of America per se. Um, do you think there's any validity to the fact of like, well, if we, even as a Jewish people can invest more in Israel directly then that in and of itself could bolster Israel's success and future versus, cause right now it's kind of this split. What I find is it's a split. It's like this diversion, like, okay, we got to support Israel and there's a war and everything, but like, we have to make sure the government in America wants our back and is supporting us. And we have their fun. So it's like, I don't know, maybe we're putting our eggs in too many baskets. And that's also part of the challenge. No, I mean, I think it's not mutually exclusive. I think the Jewish people should be safeguarding Israel so that the mission of Israel in the first place was with, was which to make sure there's never a Holocaust ever again and never again. We should be investing in Israel um, and also our friends should be investing in us too. Um, So what a lot of people don't know is most of the money that the U.S. sends to Israel is used to buy U.S. weapons. So it comes right back to the U.S. I don't think most people know that. They think like, oh, taxpayer money is just going to Israel. No, they're using it to buy weapons from the U.S. So it's coming right back. Meanwhile, the U.S. gets a lot of technology from uh, and technological collaborations from startups and intelligence uh, startups in Israel. So it actually is a very mutually beneficial and mutually dependent relationship. Don't think that the U.S. doesn't need Israel. They need us. There's a lot of collaborations between uh, law enforcement, FBI, CIA. There's a lot of collaboration in intelligence and intelligence work between the two countries. So I don't want you to think that Israel's dependent on the U.S. U.S. is also very dependent on Israel. Right. Yeah. No. Well said. Well said. Um, what is what has been your connection with Israel growing up, like even from when you were in Iran, was there any conversation about Israel up until now? How was it Honestly, you know, just outside of like, you know, the few times a year we would go to temple. No, but you know, my aunt lives in Israel. My dad's sister moved there and got married to an Israeli and still to this day continues to live there. I have cousins there and my cousin's kids are serving in the IDF right now. Um, It's very interesting to me, Izzy, that, and I don't know if you felt the same way within, you know, the New York Persian Jewish community, but when everyone started attacking Israel in 2021, I literally went into survival mode and just went off on my social media. I lost 3,000 followers in the first 30 minutes of posting. Um, 
And I just kept going because it was such a survival gut instinct for me to defend the Jewish people and their native land. Okay. When everything started happening in Iran, I hesitated. I had mm-hmm. a little bit of ambivalence and I wondered why. And it was You're really at a few years ago, like yeah. or whatever it was two years ago and every, yeah. everything. Yeah. There. Even okay. recently with the whole, you know, Zan Zan Digioza, the like life, women, freedom. Yeah movement, I hesitated. Even though I lived in Iran, I've never lived in Israel. Why am I like defending Israel with all of my like soul? And I'm not feeling the same need. And in fact, a little bit of ambivalence towards Iran. And I think it was, you know, if you ask a lot of members, older members of our family who left Iran, were like, do you ever want to go back? And they're like, never, I never want to go back because it was such a traumatic, horrific treatment of the Jewish Persians in Iran. And I think that the defining factor in my own brain and psyche without me even like thinking about it was I know that Israel, if you dropped my butt, my Jewish butt in Israel and somebody attacked me, somebody would come help. They would save me. Mm. And that's Mm. not what the Iranian people did. They said, we're not Jewish. Why should we care? We're not Baha'i. Why should we care? You know, only when it was one of their own that was killed brutally, then they started to wake up and care. So... There was a feeling of among a lot of people, and I don't know if you've had these conversations at your dinner table, but it's like, what did they expect to happen? This is the punishment of what their parents did. Their parents abandoned the Jews. Their parents abandoned the Baha'is. Their parents abandoned the minority groups in Iran and overthrew the Shah and brought in the Islamic Republic. You know, you, you made your bed, now sleep in it. That was kind of the, the feeling. It took me a while to get around and be like, you know, no, they have come around and we should help them and they are speaking up and we should support them. But it took me a minute, to be honest, because there's there was resentment and there was anger. I think understandably so. I think it's a loyalty element, right? Yeah. We, we know that our, like as a people, we're loyal to each other and we protect each other. Not Not only... Jews want to help Jews. I mean, we as a people are taught to help to bring light in this world to do good. So we are, we, but you see, we shouldn't do it at our own peril. True. Oh, we, can't. we should not. We need to get out of that. We need to get out of the and and we need to meet people for where they are are at that moment. Okay, you can't have a two state solution with a people that want you dead. Correct. Eventually, when we go into the you know. UNRWA educational system and re- re- revamp it like many countries did. You know, uh, Egypt revamped their educational system to, in- to take out uh, demonizing Jews. You know, mm-hmm. Germany did. Yeah. Germany took it out of their educational yeah. system to stop. You have to de-radicalize the population first, and that comes through their educational system. You know, right now, uh, there's a Palestinian that gave an interview that said that their math problems are like, if you have five Jews and you kill three of them, how many are left? Mm-hmm. Their physics problems are based on missiles into Israel. Okay, so first you have to de-radicalize the population, get them from here to here, then from here to here, then from here to here. Then you can start discussing two states when they actually want peace and they want to thrive and their entire story and identity is not wrapped around the murder of Jews and the annihilation of the state of Israel. You can't take someone from here to here. You have to get them to here and then get them to here. And right now they're here as far as willingness to acknowledge the state of Israel and the right of Jews to live, just to live, just to be alive. Right. So yes, we need to bring light into the world, but we, we cannot take someone who's been in darkness for so long and turn on the lights all of a sudden. You have to slowly dim the light more. And I mean, you know, take it from a dim light to a slightly brighter light. And then eventually it'll, you know, you can't, you can't take people that want you dead and um, say, I'm going to bring light onto the world for you. Like, that's not how it works. Very true. I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I get frustrated, where I get frustrated, right? Because, okay, 
I hear you in two state solution, right? It's it's not a viable. It makes situation. no sense. And the people like that tried to illusion right now. Right. Are you insane? You want a two state solution when ninety five percent of the population there condoned the October seventh massacre? You think that. these people want peace right now? They don't. It's and I'm not saying it's their fault. It's no, their indoctrination. Really it's their education system. It's you know what this other person said. He said every morning and. In school, when they got to school, the first thing they would do is throw rocks at Israelis, and then they would go into their classrooms to start studying. I mean, like this was this was where in the in, in Gaza. Oh god, ah, like images and stuff. Okay, I see. No, not images. This is firsthand testimony, saying this is what they taught us in school. We would wake up, we would go to school, we would come outside with our teacher, throw rocks, and then go back in and start our studies, which included the death and destruction of Jews within our math curriculum, within our physics curriculum, within our um, songs that we sang, with, like, within everything. So this is, this is my question. Like, solution, no solution, okay. Understanding there has to be like this trickle effect into the education, education system and all that. How do we deal with the fact that the world today is moving. We are not 80 years ago in, in Germany. Like we are in a time where everything is moving at lightning speed. So for us to sit here and say, well, we need to go and infiltrate the education system and change the day. The radicalization has happened. It's here. It's in our backyard. I know, I, Izzy, but how do you think it happened? When do you think right, the radicalization here started? Tell me. A trickle effect. No. No. From, no. From, when did it start? From, I how mean, many years ago did it start? Probably years ago. 20 I'm years not- ago, 20 years ago, it started. And why is the number 20? Because that's how long it takes for the education of a generation. Hmm. It started 20 years ago. The well, lawsuit that was brought against pretty- Columbia University this week cites 20 years of anti-Semitism on campus that has been left unchecked. So again, the Jews are busy bringing light onto the world and living in this delusion that everyone on the face of the planet has the same core values that we do. And it's time for us Jews, especially Mizrahi Jews and Sephardic Jews, South American Jews, to be loud and let people know that they need to start listening to us. They need to start listening to our firsthand experiences, our first generation experiences of living with people who value death over life, who value martyrdom over life. Their core values are not what you think. It is narcissistic and naive for US Jews to believe that everyone wants to be like us. They don't want or to be like just us. Quiet down. They hate your that's- core values. And the, and the chief core value of life is not the same. So they need to wake up, get over their narcissism that everyone wants to be like you and believes everything and has the same core values as you, start listening to what they're saying and writing down in their charters and start fighting, this is good versus evil. This is no longer nuanced, it's not context-based. Is rape good or bad? Izzy, is rape good or bad? Black and white. It's black and white. There is no context. And the fact that we're seeing college kids condone the rape of Jews, Jewish women, we're seeing feminists silent or condoning by any means necessary the rape of women in this world. We are fighting chaos. (laughs) We are fighting evil. We are fighting indoctrination. And until you call it out, exactly how it is. And I know it's harder to call it out in New York than it is in Los Angeles. I know New York's behind Los Angeles on this, but until you start making, until you start making the correct diagnosis, Izzy, you will not be able to apply the correct treatment. And you cannot be afraid to call out the correct diagnosis. As you know, in our community, nobody wanted to go get tested for cancer one generation ago. They didn't want to hear the C word. They didn't want that diagnosis, but unfortunately you can't cure and treat without verbalizing those tough words. And I encourage you to start speaking to your parents. I encourage your community and the, and the kids your age and the young people your age to start speaking with their parents 
and stop trying to fit in to a world that has no firsthand experience of what we do. Yeah, I think I think what I've experienced a little bit is like this feeling of it'll go away. Like that it that's the away. that those are the conversations I have a lot. And 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 it's crazy to me because it never went away in the past. So why do we think, why, how could it be? It's you know? easier to think that way. It's so difficult to say, I have to do the hard work. Right. I, I feel like people are also tired. Yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. What are you tired from? You haven't even started. <laughs> I mean, not me. I'm not tired. Well, you know I'm yeah, talking to like, like, but, like people saying I'm tired. Like, what did you do that you're tired? Well, I think so, like subconsciously, there's just this feeling of like, like even, okay, there's an idea of epigenetics, right? Like, like, we carry the trauma from generation to generation. You have firsthand trauma, right? I, I don't, thankfully. I was born into a very privileged world in life. And it took me until I was like 15 or 16 to even process like, oh my God, my dad like lost everything and had to restart his whole life. Like, and even my mom who like came earlier and came with things like also had to restart a whole life. And my grandmother, like I was in a total delusion. But I've, I mean, I think even from, from someone like me and my generation who, who's had that experience, like there is this notion of like, we are caring and it's not an excuse, but like, I think just subconsciously puts people into a, a mindset of like, like, I just can't deal anymore. Like, it's just, what else do you want to do? But like, okay, it's not, it's a, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. And it's a- I mean, this is very fresh to you. I don't think that this is, first of all, I would say, um, try to stay away, Izzy, as much as you can from um, this DEI language of things like words like privileged. Everyone has advantages and everyone has disadvantages in this world. You shouldn't be ashamed of your parents' success. Success is a good word. Success, grit, resilience, opportunity, talent. These are good words. So stay away from these words like privileged and oppressor and um, this uh, very divisive and sh- uh, shaming and, and bad connotation language. I want you to just reject it. Things like your truth, stay away from that language. There's the truth and there's your feelings about the truth, but there is only one truth, not your truth. Like stay away from those. It's actually very harmful. It is. So I encourage you to do that. <laughs> you have nothing to be ashamed of. Everyone has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and that's just the way the world works. That's never going to go away. It's never going to be an equal playing field. And the more we say that to our kids to try to make kids that, you know, had food on the table or a roof over their head feel like they need to apologize for that is actually insane. So let, let me just start there. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, look, I, it's, it's true. Like it's not into it. Don't feed into it. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, unfortunately what this sort of language and the whole DEI mentality has done has been co-opted by these uh, left of left people. This is, this kind of language is what has let college kids and university students and even medical doctors to justify what Hamas did on October 7th. Unfortunately, I know it wasn't the intention maybe when people said diversity, equity, inclusion, but that's what's happened. Um, I am actually working right now on an alternative called detail, which is diversity of thought and life experience. Everyone's life experience is important and valuable. Your proximity to whiteness doesn't make your life experience less valuable. It doesn't make your voice less worthy of being heard. And diversity isn't about skin color or religion or creed. That's not what Martin Luther King wanted. Diversity is a thought. And we need to bring conversations back. We cannot be walking on eggshells on our university campuses. What is the point of going to college if you're walking on eggshells and afraid to have honest conversations and learn from each other and learn learn other people's point of view? So all the anti-Semitism we're seeing on campus, all of this craziness and upside down world that we're seeing is being justified, unfortunately, by the co-opting of the DEI movement. So again, I stay away from words that feed into that. I stay away from phrases and thought processes that tell people they have to shut up and they're racist for asking questions. 
The whole point of college is to ask questions and to challenge. This is, this is not where our country should be headed. This was Iran. Iran made us shut up. Iran forbid us from questioning. Iran shuts down individualism. We don't want that to happen to the US. And the words that we use are very important. Right. So I know I asked this in the beginning, a little, a little while back, like what it is, like the feeling of Israel and here, and you were saying that in Israel, you know that like someone have your back. Like basically, you, you know you'd be in a way okay there, even though there's a war and we have yeah. enemies and there. So is there ever a part of you, and you mentioned that you're here and you're like fighting the fight because you also see that, you know, we need, we need a strong America to have a strong Israel. But is there ever a part of you that's just like, yeah, it would just be like, like, let's just go to Israel. Like, let's just go there. And like, I know it's good. And that's where I'm in a way meant to be. I don't know. I won't put words in your mouth. I don't know if you feel that way. You can comment or if you do I or don't. I think that um, I haven't had the feeling like I need to move to Israel. I haven't had that feeling, uh, to be honest. No. Um, I know I want to safeguard my family there, as anybody would want to safeguard their family. Your family that's um, there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I know that um, it's important to have a diaspora. And it's important to also have Jews in Israel, in our homeland, in our biblical homeland, as has been described in the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. Um, so no, I haven't had a feeling like I need to move there at all. Um, I understand th that feeling of wanting to go there. Um, it's interesting, there was a British parliamentarian this morning I saw on TV who stood up and said he just got back from Israel and he felt safer in Israel than he does in London. Yeah. So I feel the, not, like- Non-Jewish, just to clarify. Uh, I don't know if he's Jewish or non-Jewish, probably Jewish. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's sad, right? That Europe has allowed and tolerated um, areas and cities that have com are completely being run by Sharia law. Like the British police will not enter these areas. They are self-governing and they are governing themselves with Sharia law within England. Many places, not one. How? How is that? Per because they let all these uh, immigrants in. We're bringing light onto the world. We're bringing light. We need to accept all the immigrants. So they're coming in, no papers. They not only live off of the welfare system over there, they brag about living off of the welfare system so much as so to go on and say, you, the British people work for me. And they let that happen in their countries under the guise of altruism. And this is what happens. And we've seen it over and over again in many countries, in many continents. But they, they uh, are living in la-la land. We need to stand up to this extremist Muslim mentality, just like the moderate Muslims in Iran are standing up to it. It's okay to call it out. Right, it's true. You have seen such a strong, even, and, and they're under a much more intense, oppressive situation. And you've seen people come out and use their voice. And what's so interesting is here, the only people I, that I've experienced, and I'm not, I mean, maybe I'm wrong and I'm missing them, but for the most part, who are the people coming out and using their voice? It's the Jews, and that's because we're the ones that are on their, we're always the first line of fire, so we're feeling it. So we're like, okay, right, I'm, I'm gonna speak up now. And everyone else, it's like, we're like looking at them, like, are you waiting for the ball to drop? Because the ball's gonna drop. So either listen now and join the fight, or, you know, we're gonna, we're all gonna be well, much worse off for it. I think yes and no. So I started fighting this fight four years ago, and I will tell you that most Jews weren't fighting the fight until October seventh. Right, right. It's been the past few months. So yeah. did the ball have to drop for your your friends, Izzy? Why did the ball have to drop for them to start fighting the fight? <laughs> so what what woke? Don't I think be don't be calling earlier. out other people when yeah, yeah, Jewish fair. people fair themselves enough. waited for the ball to drop. Fair Why? Enough. Why did you wait for the ball to drop? Fair enough. What, what I'll ask you, I think you alluded to it earlier, but just to like make it clear, what, what was the impetus for you to wake up and say? Oh, well, my, my yeah, daughter was applying to high schools. I knew she was four years away from college. I was acutely aware of what was happening on campus at my alma mater, Columbia University. Hmm. And I started with a very trepidatious hashtag Shabbat Shalom. That's where it started. 
And that just opened up a door where you saw kind of the truth unveiled in a way. Yeah. Don't wait for the ball to drop. Don't wait for another ball to drop. And I'm speaking to the 70% of Americans that support Israel and the Jewish people. Don't wait. Yeah. I think right now also it's very interesting because I feel like we're in this weird like holding period. And in those times you can very easily just, again, be like, oh, oh we're good. Let's move forward. But most definitely not. And, and yeah, need to, need to use our voice, not, not hold our breath. I hear it. Yeah. I guess uh, just on a, on a lighter note, to end on a lighter note, <laughs> if you had to kind of describe, I like to just ask everyone, like what, what home is to you and how you, how you describe home. Um, you can connect it both to like your different identities, being a Persian, Jew, Honestly, American. Honestly, my favorite thing is just being with my kids. Um, so home is where my, my kids, my husband, my family. I work so hard here. I work so hard online, um, you know, pitching another show soon, uh, writing a book. Yeah. I, I always joke I have no friends. I have like two friends, but I don't really like <laughs> hang out with people. <laughs> outside of like bar mitzvahs and like even bar mitzvahs I'll go for like an hour and I'm like okay is it time to go home yet um so I think that you know I'm just working so hard trying to make as much impact as possible that really home is just where my family is and um just spending time with them is the most important thing well, that's what it all comes down to I say you never you never wish you had another hour at the office so yeah <laughs> at the end of the day okay well thank you for everything you're doing thank you for, for sharing and being uh, brutally honest which I think is very necessary and uh, I hope you continue to use your voice uh, for the Amazing. good amazing you too waking, Izzy waking us up so, thank you alright <laughs> thanks for listening to another episode of My Israel Narrative if you enjoyed this episode make sure to follow along and subscribe until next time I'm Israel Afai